Hello, everybody, and happy Steel Day. Welcome to AISC's Steel Day webinar, Resilient. You can't even spell it without steel. Presented today by Charles J. Carter. We want to welcome everyone for joining us today. My name is Brent Liu. I am with AISC, and I will be moderating today's presentation. I mentioned today's speaker is Charles J. Carter. He is the Vice President and Chief Structural Engineer for AISC, where he has worked since 1991. He received his Bachelor and Master's of Science degrees in Architectural Engineering from Penn State University and his PhD in Civil and Architectural Engineering from the University or the Illinois Institute of Technology. He is a licensed structural engineer and professional engineer in Illinois. Charlie serves as the Secretary um, of the AISC Committee on the Code of Standard Practice and is a member of many other committees and professional associations related to the design of buildings and steel structures. We're very pleased to have Charlie here today. Charlie, thanks for being here. I'm going to hand things over to you. Okay, thank you, Brent. Welcome, everybody, and happy Steel Day. Uh, this lecture has become an AISC tradition over the years, and I'm happy you're here to share it with me. You already know the title from all of the publicity. Uh, I'm sure you caught my play on words using resilient because it, uh, it met my uh, mold where I put the uh, word steel into the title. Uh, there's an alternative form of the word resilient that seems to be the hottest word since sustainability. Of course, that word is resilience. Lots of people are talking about this in one way or another. Some use it as a marketing word. Marketing words often become throwaways, but this is not a throwaway word. In fact, it's a big word with lots to consider when you decide to consider resilience in one of your projects. It begins by encompassing everything you normally consider in the design of a project. And if you've been to one of these lectures before, you know I like to have a little fun with the slides. And uh, I'll get some help from Hollywood as we list the things. Of course, dead and live loads are so basic, but they are ultimately a part of resilience. They are there when the structure does whatever the rest of the impact on the structure is, and uh, their effects are important. There also is rain load, as Gus, the star of the Pixar short, Partly Cloudy, reminds us. More familiar, perhaps, Yukon Cornelius reminds you of snow load. Scrat, the saber-toothed tiger from Ice Age series, recalls that ice is a load consideration. These are all so basic, and yet they can impact resilience in more ways than just structural, but certainly structurally. It might be more well understood that wind load is a factor. Certainly recent news uh, about seismic loads. Uh, in fact, this picture is from a wine storage facility uh, that suffered some damage in the Napa earthquake. The building seems to have had a greater resilience in this case than the barrel racking system. Perhaps this reminds you, as it did of me, uh, did me of the scene in Animal House when Bluto realizes that Faber College took the bar, and he exclaims, they took the bar. <laughs> Back to Hollywood, we know we need to be resilient for Sharknados. Sorry, I couldn't resist that one. But back to something that's closer to reality and stepping up a notch in terms of conditions that often get special consideration from a resilience perspective, we have fire effects. And Mother Nature has shown us recently we have things like Hurricane Sandy, shown here for some of its iconic damage on the Jersey Shore. Tornadoes are in our consciousness. This graphic shows the paths of a couple of tornadoes that affected more, one in 1999, one in 2013. There are many other locales that have sim had similar experiences as more. And tsunami effects are also in our consciousness after the Japan experience and others. Finally in my list, terrorism is an impact for resilience. 
We could also go on to di discuss things like accidents and other threats, but I think you get the idea that resilience asks us to contemplate known and unknown events, also that everything we do design for directly and other things that can affect what we design, even when not considered directly in the design, will factor into the resilience of the structures that we design and construct. We also should recognize that structural resilience is only a part of the total resilience picture. Nonetheless, the structural part is the part to which we can speak, and that is why I'm focusing on it today. Now, before I go further, I'd, I'd like to tack on a topic here that begs a question. Is resilience a part of sustainability, or is resilience the same as sustainability? And there's a, a lot of people that will give you all of the answers that you could think of for this question. And as I contemplate it, uh, it's possible that the answer is yes. I think the answer is yes, or they are at least similar if the outcome and event of an event is that you don't have to tear down and landfill materials. But the answer would be no, on the other hand, if you never have an event or if you do and landfill anyway, resilient design can actually be the opposite of sustainability. Thus, as Kermit the Frog regularly advises, uh, this is a combination where it's not easy being green. In the end, my suggestion is to not try to equate them. Consider what the need is in your design and make good decisions for both where you can. Where your decisions force you to pick one or the other, well, then you'll have to do so based upon your judgment. In the end, there are so many things to consider, and it can be a challenge to determine what to do. What does it all mean? Well, there are many organizations trying to help you figure that out, and I'll tell you about a few of them. The Rockefeller Foundation uh, is a private entity that's funded an initiative called 100 Resilient Cities. Uh, one thing you'll note if you take the time to look at their website and see about their initiative is that their effort is probably the broadest uh, since they're interested in everything, not just structures, not just buildings. Uh, they're interested in resilient cities. They're looking at physical, social, economic challenges, not just the structural segment of resilience that we deal with. There also is an effort by NIBS that stands for the National Institute of Building Sciences. NIBS is a contractor to federal agencies like FEMA, the Department of Homeland Security, and they are funded to undertake activities like this. Uh, resilience is one area in which they're focusing. There's even uh, a Resilient Design Institute. You can actually see in this slide on their web page they are attempting to help define what is resilience. And of course, all of the groups are, are attempting to do that. Now, note that the topic of resilience is young enough that there are many divergent viewpoints about resilience. Different groups define it differently and have different goals. Many groups are trying to work in the area of resilience. I may have already called it a buzzword. It's certainly a word showing up in as much as people can write it in as they can, including some that don't seem to have resilience in mind so much as marketing their products. I suggest you should be careful of such messages. This image shows the entry of a Polish architect named Robert Konieczny in a safe house design competition. It's been called a zombie-proof house, perhaps by sci-fi channel enthusiasts. It also serves my purpose to depict what would be normal if my friends in the Portland cement industry succeeded. They've been pitching building code proposals for changes to the international building code over and over. They started out as sustainability proposals before resilience was a buzzword. Now they're called resilience proposals. To date, they've been summarily dismissed as self-serving, no matter what they've been called, and I can appreciate that. There also is the wood segment of the marketplace that is imploring engineers and code officials to choose their material interest. The pitch at times is evangelic, presenting wood as a righteous path of enlightenment. Certainly this slide depicts that. 
Mostly that centers on sustainability claims, but you'll now start to see the word resilience infiltrating that pitch. Of course, you know I have my own self-interests, don't I? It's likely you don't need it, but if you do, I'd like to give you a strategy for recognizing sales pitches. It's an easy one if you are about my age. If you are, you know what this is automatically because you saw it every Saturday morning in between ABC's cartoons. If you were not so lucky, just search Schoolhouse Rock on YouTube and you will be enlightened. Look for this episode in particular. It's the one called Unpack Your Adjectives. And if you watch it, you will be well prepared to spot sales pitches because you will easily spot the adjectives that get used. You'll hear, this is better. You'll hear, this is greener. You'll hear, we're more sustainable or less expensive. And on and on until you get to the topic at hand today. We're more resilient. And so uh, trigger words, things like more or better, or my personal favorite, more better, you'll know you're being sold. All right, I have to admit that Weird Al Yankovic just entered the webinar on my previous slide. We have a word crime, I know. More better is a regional phrase. It may have been fine when I was growing up as a resident Jersey boy, but I know it isn't correct grammar or usage. And so I'll take Weird Al's advice and not be a moran. Well, enough of that. I promised you a strategy, and here it is. As your strategy, I, su I suggest you imitate Willy Wonka. No, I don't mean you should wear a purple velvet jacket and fancy top hat. Rather, I'm suggesting you master the look that you see on Gene Wilder's face right here in his portrayal of Willy Wonka. It's the look that says, you know I know you're lying, right? So do your w best, Willy Wonka, when you start to get sold a bill of goods. So great, but now what's an engineer to do when conversations of resilience start? In the end, we want to do things that will actually benefit the project and make a difference. I suggest there's three steps that you can follow and be very successful. The first step is to ask, what does the building code require? This is what we have to do in any case. The second step is to ask, what else does the client want? And I suppose I should add the phrase here to say, what else does the client want, if anything? Often the client may not know when something additional should be done. Perhaps this is an opportunity for you to suggest what the client should want based on the specifics of the project. It may be nothing, but it may be more than what the code requires. The final step is to ask yourself, what are the smart things to do based upon the answers to questions one and two? And I'd like to look at these in a little bit of detail. So we'll start back at one. And to begin, I think it's logical to look at what is required in the IBC. Various dates of this document are in force in the majority of jurisdictions in the United States. The first version to have explicit requirements for structural integrity was the 2009 version. Now note that at that time it was called structural integrity. And so that's, that's uh, fairly synonymous. Before then it had other names as well. The commonly held starting point for all of this is the structure in this slide. This is Ronan Point which in 1968, uh, on the 18th floor, resident Ivy Hodge went into her kitchen in the middle of the night to make tea. She ignited a gas leak she didn't know she had, and the explosion blew out the precast wall panel in her corner kitchen. Since the whole structure, in this case, was a stack of precast components with little more than friction to tie them together, the progression of damage produced what you see in this picture. This damage was called progressive collapse, and it has been discussed uh, with that name or another ever since. More recently, it's tending to be called disproportionate collapse. 
in in later years, uh, the United States saw uh, something of this kind in Oklahoma City. The bomb produced this destruction, but it was concluded after study that 85% of this damage was progressive due to the loss of a single column as an initial consequence of the blast. Our discussions of structural integrity have progressed to code discussions after our further experience with the Pentagon and also the World Trade Center in 2001. In the steel world, uh, the 2010 AISC specification contained provisions that are coordinated with the IBC language. And it had requirements, uh, I should say it has requirements, applicable when specified in the applicable building code. Of course, I said earlier that the applicable building code is usually the IBC. And IBC section 1614 uh, describes the applicable case as high-rise buildings in risk category 3 or 4. That means these provisions are required for high-rise buildings in risk category 3 and 4. There are, they can be used elsewhere, but they are required in these cases. I'd like to give you some highlights of these provisions. And I'll start with uh, this first one. The criteria in these provisions are all applied independently, not in combination with other effects. I'll also highlight we accept behaviors that we would not for routine design when making integrity checks. We'll let bolts bear uh, and that deformation occur. We will accept loads and deformations parallel to slots and bolted joints. We'll accept significant member and component deformations. For example, we would be happy for an integrity check if angles in a shear connection held together even as they were pulled straight under load. There are many other such examples, but the point is we don't limit integrity checks for extreme conditions to the limits that we enforce for routine design. In the end, the goal is to provide for redistribution in the event of damage. Now, let me also make you aware of some further improvements that are coming. The AISC specification is uh, currently being discussed for update to a 2016 version, and one of the areas of improvement is in the structural integrity provisions, better coordinating and better linking with what is in the IBC. Uh, one important note I'll point out here, there's one local jurisdiction that has done something similar but not identical to what I'm going to show you. The New York City Building Code has structural integrity provisions that are mostly similar but not identical. If you do a project in New York City with the New York City Building Code, you should keep that in mind. For our purposes here, uh, I'll return my focus now to IBC and the AISC 360 provisions. And at the start, we can look at the calculations, because this is going to apply to everything that I'm going to tell you about today. First thing is that all structural integrity checks are based upon design using nominal strength. Said another way, or said uh, uh, further, the, the, this means that phi and omega are not used. It's not an LRFD design or an ASD design. It's a design at nominal strength. Phi doesn't come into it for LRFD. Omega doesn't come into it for ASD. As a result, the integrity checks produce the same design result, whether you're using LRFD or ASD. Now, there are three areas that we focus on in the integrity requirements in the AISC specification proposal. The first of those three is column splices. And we'll talk about those first. To do so, I've created a cartoon column. And uh, this could be a gravity splice, in which case it would have load in it like this. It might be another kind of splice, and it could have other loads. But we're going to focus uh, on the splice itself regardless. And uh, the same provision applies regardless of what type 
of splice it is. Now the idea of the provisions is that you would have a minimum nominal tension strength requirement for each splice. And that's depicted in the image on this slide. The load that's designed for in this splice is dead plus live, just nominal values, dead plus live. And those are applied over the area that's tributary to the column between the splice being designed and the next splice below. That's this part of the column shaft right there. And the idea here is to get all the loads that enter into that segment of the column, assuming there's damage below, and making sure that you can hang from the splice above for dead plus live over the area tributary. And if you happen to be at the base of the building uh, in the first tier uh, of the construction, we're not talking about between the splice and the next splice down. We're talking between the splice and the, and the, and the base plate. But I think you get the idea. And so that's a simple provision. Again, it's nominal strength, and the loads are calculated on a nominal basis as well. The second area of the requirements covers beam and girder end connections. And again, I'll put a cartoon on the slide. We're looking at connections of beams to beams, beams to girders, or beams to columns, like the connection shown in this cartoon. Uh, I have chosen to illustrate the beam to column case. Um, but it's similar for whatever shear connection, uh, beam to beam, uh, beam to girder, or beam to column, or girder to column. And here we'll bring ASD and LRFD back in because it's convenient. Uh, you have already calculated the shear on the connection in the real structure due to the actual loads that are present in your structure. You've already presumably done the design of the structure before you're checking integrity. And in ASD, you would get a shear V sub A, or in LRFD, you would get a shear V sub U. And because we already have these, the simplest approach is to use those in formulating the integrity check. In the integrity check, we're going to determine uh, an artificial axial force that will design the connection to resist. In reality, we're usually just going to be making sure that the connections we already designed satisfy this additional integrity check. But in, in any case, we're worried about attention, and I've called it uh, value A, as shown on this slide. If I'm doing allowable stress design, I'm going to set A, the axial force, equal to V sub A. In other words, the calculated vertical shear becomes the independent, uh, independently applied axial force A in an ASD design. If I designed using LRFD, I'm going to use A equal to two-thirds of the calculated shear value. And there, there is a logic to that uh, that's illustrated by this relationship. I started out by saying structural integrity isn't an ASD check or an LRFD check. Uh, we're using ASD values and LRFD values for convenience here, and we know that the relationship between V sub A and V sub U involves this two-thirds factor as shown in this equation. Again, we only use ASD and LRFD to start because it's easier. You already have the calculated shear, and it's simple to adapt as shown. Now note one additional thing, there is a 10 kip minimum shear value. I doubt that would control in most cases, but it can control in some cases. I think you'll find for most connections, and particularly the shear connections in the AISC manual, the integrity check is not difficult to satisfy when you've already designed for the shear force. There are other connection cases, moment connections, bracing connections. Those tend to have automatic tension, strength. Shear connections may or may not. There is a paper by Lou Geschwinder and Kurt Gustafson in the AISC Engineering Journal that shows for single plate connections, there's always a limit state vertically 
that will control before a limit state horizontally controls. In other words, you can say if the shear tab satisfies the vertical load requirement for the connection, it will automatically satisfy the integrity check for the artificial tension that's applied. I suspect you could also show that quite easily for other connections. There are a few, particularly those in the AISC manual, there are a few of those that are exceptions. Seated connections have a great vertical shear capacity and do not have as comparable a horizontal tension capacity. In that case, I think I would approach the problem by putting some rebar in the slab as a way to transfer the integrity force. Uh, there's probably some other things that could be done. Also, uh, double angles welded to the support, say for a knifed connection where the beam is, the angles are connected to a column flange in the shop by welding and the beam is knifed. There's now a tension force that tends to open the root of the fillet weld in the integrity check and that's not a very good condition. In the UK, their approach to solving that has been to extend the weld from the bottom of the angle on the back side of the first angle welded uh, so that you're welding along the heel of the angle in the compression zone where the angle is not flexing away from the support in a shear connection and provide tension capacity that way for the integrity check. And it doesn't affect the behavior of the connection when you do that. Okay, that's enough on this case. There's the third case to move on to, and that is connections that brace columns. I'll use a cartoon again. Uh, here is my cartoon column, and whenever we say something's braced, we draw an X. So I'll add a cartoon X to my column and say that's the braced point, and we need to make sure for an integrity check that the bracing member that's creating that X can provide a tension capacity great enough uh, to ensure that the column bracing is maintained in an integrity demand situation. If we look at our column, we know that there's an axial load in it. In ASD, I've called that C sub A. In LRFD, I've called that C sub U. And here again, we're going to come up with an integrity force, a tension force on the connection of the member that's providing that bracing. The value that I've chosen again is A. And if I look, this is following a similar path. If my compression in ASD was C sub A, uh, I can calculate the value of the integrity tension as 1% of the axial force in the column, C sub A. You can figure out where that 1% came from quite easily if you go into Appendix 6 in the AISC specification. Usually you'll find the strength demand is about 1%. Uh, many people are familiar with the 2% rule that attempted to uh, encompass strength and stiffness requirements, but the strength demand um, in any case is more like 1% in the typical bracing scenario, and that's what's used here. It may be less than that, but 1% is simple enough, and that's what we've used. Similarly to before, since we're using an ASD value or an LRFD value, for LRFD you have 1% of two-thirds. In the end, you get the same uh, integrity force for your nominal strength check, whether you're doing ASD or LRFD. At least they're very similar. Uh, there might be slight differences. They might be dead on uh, one value to the other uh, at two-thirds of its value. That is the new proposal in the AISC specification in a nutshell. It's simple, straightforward, uh, and it's coordinated with the IBC requirements. I think the proposal creates better connectivity, which should equal better performance. And the astute among you, uh, uh, you'll wonder, uh, I wondered if any of you would catch that I just used an adjective. I gave you advice about people using adjectives better. So uh, I could rephrase this uh, this way and say it provides for unanticipated tension forces 
Um, of course, the very astute among you will notice that unanticipated is also uh, an adjective, but uh, certainly it's not the kind that should give you the Willy Wonka look. Now, a few additional things before we move on. Uh, this approach uses connection design forces only. It, it, it must be kept in mind we're not placing additional forces on the structure. We're not creating uh, additional load cases. We're not combining the structural integrity forces with any other loads. We're not checking members for the forces either. We're just checking the connections between the members so that they have enough to hold together in case we need them to. Okay, that covers item one in my one, two, three list. And we can move on to item two. This will actually be a short item, uh, but I do want to talk about what the client wants or what the client should want beyond code requirements. I said before it could be that they want nothing, that they don't know to want something. Um, if in the end it's nothing, then uh, the code requirements uh, apply, and that makes the solution a little easier to envision. There also could be a request for a prescriptive solution. That's another type of approach where we might design a structure to survive the removal of a column, for example. Uh, there might be some event that causes damage in a common way used in structural assessment for that case is to do what some call the immaculate uh, column removal, because it assumes that the joint above the column and the joint below the column are undamaged, which probably isn't the case. But it's a, a prescriptive way to go about checking a structure to see what it could do if it were called upon to do it. There are other prescriptive approaches, but you get the idea with that discussion. There also could be a more performance-based approach, a performance-based design solution pursued. Uh, there may be a desire to address a known or calculable threat. If so, that's going to lead more towards a performance-based design uh, in and of itself. Whether you do prescriptive or performance-based solutions when there's something more to do than what's required in the building code, um, I'd like to look at how we could begin to think and answer uh, as we take on the third step, uh, which was what are the smart things that we can do. And I think there are many things that are already at our disposal. Some come free, some are low cost items, and I'd like to look at those first. And if you recognize the Wall Street bull, uh, you'll re maybe remember that Wall Street teaches us again and again not to put all our eggs in one basket. There, they're just losing money. In structures, we have the potential to lose uh, something that's much more valuable. And certainly, the Wall Street adage not to put all your eggs in one basket is true for structural design. And it could not be truer for lateral systems. The more distributed our systems, the better off we're going to be for resilience. And I think the opposite holds true as well. We see a lot of structures where there's very little lateral system or as little lateral system as possible. And we should think about that. We also need to honor statics in our design. And not just statics, but also the, the statical view of the complete structure. I'd like to illustrate what I mean by looking at a case. This happens to be the, uh, an inside shot of the gymnasium, gymnasium that was at Highland East Junior High School in Moore, Oklahoma. I didn't take this picture. This was from a program uh, that was held in this gymnasium when it was upright. You can see a steel column uh, right at the end of this arrow and another one further down. And you can see some bracing. You do not see the, a connection, and I could not find a connection, between the gravity system with that light bracing and the lateral system of the rest of the building, which was that block wall behind the steel. And when I saw the building, it looked like this. This was after the tornado rolled past right on this building or very near it. 
This is what it looked like. The discontinuity between that gravity and lateral framing meant it was a susceptible system. It might not have stood anyway, but certainly the lack of a connection between the gravity system, which was probably pretty robust for the vertical load, but not very robust for the lateral load, and the block wall, which was much more robust for the lateral load, uh, helped it to fail in the manner that it did in this case. And so back to statics, we really need to make sure that we have good connection from roof to ground and a load path that's continuous from roof to ground so that we can transmit the loads from where they come in to where they need to get out. Now, as we do that, you can't forget the diaphragms. They are part of the load path. That's usually well understood when you're undertaking seismic design and perhaps less well known when undertaking wind design. Uh, but in either case, and in all cases, be sure to pay appropriate attention to the diaphragms. This is particularly important at stairwells, elevators, other areas where penetrations can result in special load transfer needs in the diaphragm. Uh, I'm not sure who made the button uh, that is depicted in this slide, loving irregularity, but as structural engineers, we certainly don't love irregularities. Uh, irregularity in structures requires attention. It would be great if we could eliminate them. That's not always possible. Uh, they must be dealt with in the design if they can't be eliminated. And the more irregularity, irregularities you see in what you're being asked to design, the greater you need to, uh, greater attention you need to pay to the resilience uh, of that structure. Remember when we're picking shapes that we calculate a load or calculate the effect and we pick from a defined list and our requirements always fall in between two shapes. You use the larger shape and that larger shape gives you additional strength that wasn't being used in the design. So there's a cross-sectional advantage when you are trying to assess resilience. There's also the actual strength. We use FY and FU, the minimum specified values in our designs um, based on ASTM specifications. And I would not use actual values in routine design, but I would account for these when I'm looking at resilience. It's uh, an easy way to do that. If you look in the AISC seismic provisions, there are RY and RT multipliers in there used for seismic calculations those are good estimates of the average values. And when you get into a prescriptive or performance-based design, uh, those values could certainly help you from a resilience perspective. There also is the fact that our tests look like this. When we test frames, members, connections, you get some curve that looks like this. And then we write equations that take advantage of the beginning of the curve. We know the rest of the curve exists. We don't count on it in routine design. But the rest of this curve is certainly available. Even things that we don't think of as very ductile, bolts in shear, welds in shear, there are curves that have tails like this, not exactly like this, but there's always something beyond the point that we're con we're willing to count in routine design. In integrity, everything matters. And we should be recognizing this when we design for integrity. Beyond that, you also get additional strength whenever you select a beam for deflection, a floor to limit vibration, or a frame to control drift. Serviceability limits give you framing that has some amount of significant strength beyond the routine design. And that is especially useful when you start to look at resilience. And then I'll, uh, another concept, when we design floors, for example, we design the slabs to span to beams, the beams to span to girders, and the girders to span to columns. And we assume everything behaves the way we think of it and the way we design it. 
In fact, the floor system doesn't know how we assumed it would behave. It behaves the way it will behave. And usually it's in this manner, with some compression ring, tension, restoring force mechanism. Now, in normal design, this isn't going to help us very much. But in a resilience case, it's definitely going to help us that this behavior exists, that it's not accounted uh, in the routine design, and that we can take advantage of it beyond what we uh, took advantage of in the routine design. Okay, I'd like to move on. There's probably other things that we could talk about, but I'd like to look at the next level, some strategies for prescriptive solutions. I'm thinking of cases where you've been asked to meet a prescriptive requirement. And one common direction that you'll see uh, often discussed is to use seismic design requirements to make a structure more robust. Uh, there is actually a FEMA publication that looked at this idea in steel. And I'll be back to that in a minute, but I'll tell you that the inspiration for that document was the comparable document that looked at seismic design benefits in reinforced concrete construction. The FEMA publication shown here, FEMA 439A, looked at the reinforced concrete MURA building in Oklahoma City. It's the document that concluded the collapse of 85% of the framing that was labeled progressive collapse could have been prevented if seismic detailing had been used. Back to the steel world, FEMA studied this same idea with a similar case. They picked a GSA-owned steel frame building that was as similar as they could find to the Murrah building uh, and put the uh, explosive at the same location relative to that building, published the results uh, in, uh, I should say they did it uh, analytically, they did not do it uh, in real life. They published the results in this document uh, called FEMA P439B. Now, the results were different for steel. Seismic details were not a dramatic improvement in the performance. That sounds like Charlie should be disappointed, but it's exactly the opposite. They found that the Oklahoma City bomb did not destroy the comparable steel column. In fact, you can see in these pictures that are on the cover of the report the damaged but surviving steel column. And this is from a real test with an identical explosion that was done in conjunction with the FEMA study on a blast range. As a result, the initial damage was lower. There was no progression of collapse. And the benefits of seismic design could only contribute a small amount because there was so little damage to begin with. And in the end, the strategy of putting a structure together that you can keep in place is one way that you can go about designing in a prescriptive way. It may also be a performance-based way. Uh, you can also look at system configuration and pick systems that are well-suited to whatever concern uh, there is or whatever prescriptive requirement has to be met. Perimeter systems, like the model shown at the left, uh, which is uh, uh, very uh, significant framing, uh, less significant, uh, more of a mega brace system is shown in the model on the right. And if you haven't already recognized what this building is from other pictures you may have seen, uh, you probably know with this slide that uh, these are the alternatives uh, that were chosen to construct the bow tower in Calgary. An amalgam of the two diagrid approaches to depicted here were used in combination for the final structure. Now, we don't necessarily have to spread the structure over the entire face and perimeter of the building. Uh, we don't necessarily have to go over the whole height of the structure. We can go back to the old approach of belt and outrigger trusses. These are useful in tall buildings for control of drift, but certainly these also can be used in structures of any height uh, to hang structure over damage below. You might not need a truss style approach that's shown here. Perhaps a strong floor approach with beefy beams will suffice. We're also usually not talking about tall buildings like these. 90% of construction is four stories and less, and uh, uh, perhaps a beefy floor uh, would suffice. Perhaps a truss is the right way to go. But uh, certainly on a structure taller than this, um, using this approach gets the protective elements up and away from 
common sources of threats to buildings. So we can pick and choose where we might want to put it. I'd like to point out that we've seen this concept and concepts like these before, and we've seen them work. The World Trade Center towers had a combination of a very distributed and robust perimeter moment frame and a hat truss at the top of the tower. I'm sure we have not recognized enough how important those two design elements were to saving the lives of many tens of thousands of people who were able to evacuate on that tragic day. I'd like to look now at performance-based design. And I've already said that the solutions may be very similar to what I talked about for prescriptive design. Performance-based design is likely to involve the use of a consultant to determine threats and associated strategies. The threats may not even be from your building. The threats may be from an adjacent building. They may be from location. They may be from something entirely different but a consultant can help determine that. You don't always need a consultant, but often a consultant will be involved in performance-based design. Performance-based design also usually uses peer review uh, to evaluate the, the performance-based design. And I already noted that many of the same strategies can be used. If you do want to pursue a performance-based design to orient your thinking, uh, I'm going to draw a simple Venn diagram. Really, it's a combination of a circle for what is desired, a circle for what is possible, and a circle for what is practical. And at the intersection of those, we can find a solution that will achieve the performance we desire using what we have and what is likely the best solution. Now, very often, I think if you zoom in on that intersection, what you'll find is that we're talking about innovative design. Often you can make take advantage of things like I showed you earlier or uh, other solutions that have already been thought of, but you may be innovating and plowing new ground. And I'd like to point out a few references that may be helpful for you uh, as you try to do that. One reference that could be very helpful to you is AISE Design Guide 26. This is Design of Blast Resistant Structures. The title is a little more limiting than what you'll find in the document. It actually focuses both on blast resistance and resistance to disproportionate collapse. But in the end, if you're talking about making a structure resilient, the concepts, whether they are applied for blast or collapse resistance, uh, will help you make your structure more resilient. So I highly recommend that you uh, download a copy of this design guide. And you can do that from AISC.org slash EPUBS. Click into the design guides, and it's a free download to our members. There's also a design guide on fire resistance, design guide 19. Depending upon your challenges, um, if fire is one of the considerations that you're trying to address in your resilient design, there's guidance in this document. Uh, there's also an appendix in the AISC specification, Appendix 4 on fire. And the combination of those two uh, get at normal fire design where it's prescriptive and more advanced fire design where it is performance-based. Now, there's, there's a lot of other challenges. Uh, that you may face in the design of structures for resilience. And as I mentioned, many of the challenges may not even be structural, but they may impact structure. And so there's likely to be many other publications that could help you depending on what you actually need. And I won't try to list all of them here. Uh, it's not possible for me to list all of them here. But as you get into your structures and you have a project and you know what you actually need, and you need help finding them, all you have to do is ask us through the AISC Steel Solution Center, and we'll connect you to any reference we have, any reference we know of, uh, and anything we can do to help you. Let me close the, the lecture part of our time today with a summary thought. And uh, that thought is that resilience, in the end, does not come from the choice of material or in an arbitrary fashion. 
Resilience comes from you as the engineer making good decisions. I poked some fun at my friends with competing material interests today, but in the end I know you can make your good decisions no matter what material you're designing, and I just hope you'll do it more often with steel. And when you do, uh, I can promise you you'll see me striking this Willy Wonka pose. And if you remember the ending of the movie, that's where you know he exclaimed, Charlie, my boy, you did it, you won. And of course, since I'm named Charlie, I remember that line very well. Thank you for your time and attention today, and I will hand it back over to Brent to manage the Q&A part of our time. All right, thank you very much, Charlie. Um, the first question <clears throat> that was presented I want to have you address. I'm going to go back to uh, your slides regarding the requirements for beam and girder connections. The question is as follows. For the, bur for the beam and girder end connections, are the bolts checked for the combined load of V sub A plus A or separately? Okay, that's a good question, and earlier in the slides uh, I talked about integrity as a separate load case. We don't combine it with everything. So you would not combine in the provisions in the IBC or in the AISC specification, you would not combine the integrity check with anything else that you've designed. You wouldn't combine it with V sub A or V sub U in this case. It's done separately. You've selected a connection uh, likely for your value of V sub A or V sub U, and you could come back and check it. Uh, if you're using a shear tab, you know it already satisfies that if you've uh, used the details that are in the AISC manual. But um, you're not combining these at all. It's just a, a bit of a prescriptive method to go back in and make sure that there's enough tension strength to provide for integrity irrespective of everything else that's applicable in the design of the frame and the members and the connections. Okay. Uh, next question. Um, are there instances where resilience design runs contrary to energy dissipation design requirements for seismic? Um, well, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, certainly, uh, depending on your threat, let's let's take uh, the commonly held threat that you could have uh, a blast, um, uh, a blast incident um, uh, as a design consideration, and you're going to do some prescriptive design, and and my guess is your columns are going to get much bigger. Will, which will help you for seismic design because columns getting bigger, uh, we try to force hinges, say, into moment-connected beams. Um, but that blast may also increase the size of the beams because they receive blast load as well. So there it could hurt you. Uh, really, it's going to depend on what system you have, where are you featuring the energy dissipation, and what is the... Uh, resilient design demanding of your structure. If you can separate them, there may be no impact and you can handle both independently, but uh, certainly there are going to be cases where they work against each other uh, if you can't separate them. Uh, just like uh, I mentioned the yes and no answer to resilience and sustainability, there's yes and no answers to this question as well. Okay. Um, next question. I, I, I believe the, the question is more so just a clarification on the on the overall theme for this. Uh, the comment in question is: Are we are we trying to show that the next set of code requirements will have that all connections have a lateral force resistance requirement to them? Um, okay, thank you for that question. The, um, the application of those requirements is based on when the applicable building code says they're applicable. And I said earlier that um, IBC, Section 1614, 
defines the applicability of integrity requirements uh, specifically to high-rise buildings uh, in risk category three and four. Uh, I think I mentioned that y you could apply these elsewhere if you chose to, but as far as what's required, this is where it's deemed to be required by the building code. And beyond that, it's, it's what does your, your owner want or what does a local jurisdiction uh, added to the requirements if they, if they do that. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying I think these are required in more than what's required in the building code. I think the typical details that you use, certainly the details that you have in the AISC manual, as I discussed before, there's a few that require some consideration. But by and large, some really smart people put those details together way back when, because as I look at them today, I can usually show that they are robust enough without any change in their design to provide for these integrity forces. Okay. And then I've had a few requests to put this slide back up um, for information as far as these three areas that come together uh, and in the center you come up with an idea where innovation is, uh, comes to the forefront. So hopefully those uh, people who were asking about that had a chance to write that down. And I think that about does it for questions today, Charlie. We are just about uh, out of time. In fact, we are, uh, we are over at this point. So thank you again, Charlie, for an excellent presentation. And I want to thank everyone else who joined us today to listen in. Uh, thank you for, for participating. Thank you for being a part of Steel Day. As I mentioned before, there's many other activities throughout the country taking place. Certainly encourage you to join one of those local activities uh, and get involved in uh, the celebration of the, the structural steel industry.